Day. So indeed, our next speaker is uh, Professor Ilya Vector to tell us about topological interfaces. Uh, please go ahead. All right, thanks. I assume that uh, everybody sees my screen. Um, yeah. So uh, first of all, thanks from, to Mark and everybody for um, giving me this opportunity to talk because I think we do uh, want to uh, kind of find uh, more points of contact between the what is condensed matter community and the uh, quantum information, quantum sensor community. And so with that in mind, I prepared the talk that is uh, largely uh, a review. And so if I don't get to talk much about my uh, research, I just wanted to acknowledge from the beginning the people who uh, contributed to it. And there are kind of two senior collaborators here who are Dan Sheehy and Bill Shelton. And then uh, there are two postdocs at LSU, one current postdoc with Bill, Damian Tristan, and uh, my former postdoc, Mahmoud Asmar, as well as uh, three students who worked on different aspects of what I'll talk about, who, who is Karen Yashirelli, Klavia Tareja, and uh, David Alsbaum. Now, uh, the looking at the title, I kind of felt that I need to uh, start by discussing why uh, topological anything and why should we care? And of course, the point is that uh, in solid state physics, we always deal with defects. So if I look at any electronic transport, I scatter on impurities, I scatter on some local fluctuations, and there is no way we can get away from it from any, in any solid state implementation. So the task in some sense, if you want to get something that is protected, uh, is to design, uh, uh, design a system such that it offers protection from local disturbances. And the best way we know to do this is to have kind of some global property, which in this case will be topological order that protects the system against local perturbations. And you know, this is uh, the cartoon that they borrowed from Richard Matuk uh, that was originally designed for superconductivity, but is uh, sort of equally well uh, applied to this situation. So imagine these are not mice, uh, by the way, these are supposed to be cows and you try to get the herd of cows back from the field and there are potholes and some of them kind of wander off. But if you tie them all to a gigantic yoke and they all move together, which is this order thing that you have, then even if one of them stumbles, uh, you're still going to get all of them home. And that's kind of the thing that we, uh, we try to talk about. And that's why in some ways the early attempts at uh, protection came in superconducting devices because this is uh, actually a perfect uh, image for superconductivity where electrons pair and then you attach them all to this all phase of the ground state of both condensed state. But I think uh, it equally well applies to the topo topological ordered states, which are the kind of the alternative way of looking at it. Now, um, I am not by any means an expert on topology. And so uh, this is the level at which I understand it. So, uh, you know, we were taught kind of an in introductory quantum mechanics that uh, there is something called adiabatic theorem. If I start with a system in its ground state and I slowly evolve it, it will stay in the ground state. Uh, now, the main contribution of Michael Berry was to show that this is not quite true, that if a Hamiltonian goes through some uh, loop in parameter space, there is an irreducible phase that appears in the wave function of the system that is called the Berry phase. And it sort of can be defined depending on the path. There is a Berry connection, there is a Berry curvature and all of that, but there is this phase. Now, there is a mathematical theorem that says that uh, integral of Berry phase over compact space without boundaries is quantized. And, you know, to me, when I first looked at it, said, said, okay, well, this is a mathematical statement. I don't know what it means, but of course we do know what it means. And we've known it now for about almost 40 years because in fact, in quantum Hall effect, the Hall conductivity is given exactly by the, this quantized Berry phase uh, multiplied by the conductance of the one quantum channel, which is E squared over H. So this actually gives you the number of channels. And the, the point is in solid state, we care about integrating this over the states that are actually filled with electrons because these are the ones that will be relevant to things like current. Now, uh, when we talk about electrons in solids, of course, what happens, the first thing we learn in an introductory uh, solid state is that uh, these electrons form 
plane wave-like states, but they live uh, in, the, there are two things we need to keep in mind. First of all, there is an index which is called the band index. So that basically says how these things arrange in energy. And the second, that this is not quite the momentum. This is something called crystal momentum. And in particular, this thing is periodic. So the far wave functions are periodic in something called reciprocal lattice vector that depends on the arrangement of my periodic crystal lattice. And so in fact, when I think about it, for example, if I want to look at the uh, allowed position, allowed distinguishable um, uh, values of this crystal momentum that correspond to something called first brilliant zone. The periodicity says that even though in two dimensions it would be some, you know, um, some uh, pentagon or hexagon or something, the periodicity cells that actually live on a torus or something like that in higher dimensions. And that is indeed a compact space without boundaries. boundaries. It's densely populated by the values of the crystal momentum and it folds onto itself. And so now this tells you that you can define the chair number, which will be quantized only if you integrate this over the entire brilliant zone. But remember, for physics, we want to uh, integrate it over the occupied states. So for example, if I have a metal, the chemical potential is somewhere here, which means the states below the chemical potential are occupied. That doesn't cover the Uh, did the connection drop? Yeah. It did. Ilya, are you there? It's frozen. Hmm. Talk was getting very interesting. <laughs> yes. Is Ilya still logged in? Oh, I think he logged out. Yeah, All right, we can just wait till Ilya comes back. Was it, still a, a, what, was it still a metal or an insulator? Uh, uh, you were just beginning all. to talk about being filled. No, it was below. The, the dotted line was below yeah. the... Okay, so this metal. was yet another one, right. So, and I'm That's sorry about this. If it happens again, I'll have to go to my uh, iPad from the computer, which sometimes has more reliable connection. But let's try to do that. Um, so the point is that I need to integrate over occupied states and the churn number is only quantized if I integrate over the entire brilliant zone, which means that if I have a metal, I'm integrating over part of it and the churn number is not quantized. But if I have an insulator, then I integrate over this entire field band. It covers all allowed values of the crystal momentum. And therefore I can classify insulators according to topological properties. The reason we care about this, because if I now make an interface between such an uh, insulator and, uh, and another object, there will be states at zero energy, that is at chemical potential, which means they're metallic. Uh, and the number of those states will be determined by the mismatch in the churn numbers. Uh, this, in fact, the, it's not quite true. In fact, the difference in the number of left and right moving states will be just, will be uh, will be given by the num by the difference in the churn numbers. Now, th there is an example where this is very important. It's the quantum Hall effect. So, what is quantum Hall effect? I take electrons, I apply a strong magnetic field, they start going in uh, in this Landau orbits, which is all good in the bulk, but at the uh, edges they will go into the skipping orbits, which basically reflect and move in one direction along one uh, side and in along another direction along the other side. And the reason now this becomes protected is because if I want to backscatter to let's say destroy the current of these electrons, I will need to scatter across the entire sample. And that of course is a macroscopic event that rarely happens. However, what I did is I applied magnetic field. I broke the time reversal invariance. If I have a time reversal invariance for each state traveling along this edge to the left, I will have another one traveling to the right. And therefore these can scatter into each other, uh, generally speaking. And 
uh, the protection does not exist. So the idea behind the topological insulators is that what we can do, we can cook up the system such that there is a spin orbit interaction and spin orbit interaction tells me that spin is somehow locked to the direction of the momentum. And so I will get the state such as, for example, up spin will move to the, to the right and down spin will move to the left. And once I do this, um, I will notice that non-magnetic scattering cannot, uh, in, cannot destroy my current. Okay. So that's, and periodically I just need to confirm that you're still hearing me. Yes. Okay, yes. good. <laughs> and so uh, in this case, uh, what will happen is that I will define the churn number for opposite spins. And this is the idea that has been explored starting about 15 years ago. And then I will get states at the surface that are insensible to the details of at least non-magnetic disorder. And these systems are called topological insulators and Ronging emphasized how important they are in particular because the idea is that you will get these uh, states at the surface of three-dimensional topological insulators that are helical. And if you proximity induce superconductivity, they will have the Majorana modes at the center of vortex cores. And if you put uh, a ferromagnetic uh, layer between the two superconductors on top of topological insulator, you will get the Majorana modes at the edges of this uh, intermediate thing and everything. And then of course, uh, this probably promises the topological quantum computing. Now, here is my kind of stupid understanding of what the translation of what the quantum, infra, quantum computing means in my language. So we need to initialize the system, which means we need to create those Majoranas. We apply gates. And in this language, it, need, we need, it means that we need to braid them. The reason we want to braid them, because again, as you heard from Rong Ying's talk, they obey non-abelian statistics. So they're non-commutative. So braiding is the way to encode and manipulate information. And then we are going to take, measure the output, which means we're measuring them. Now, measuring them generally means destroying them. And that is because what we measure is actual electron. Majorana is sort of half an electron, so we need to fuse them in order to measuring them. And that's the part, sorry, and that's the part that we know the best uh, how to do. Uh, there are some ideas about braiding, but the stumbling block to some extent was how to create this Majorana particles in condensed matter systems, because all of these ideas are good, but they encounter certain sets of problems. And the reason they encounter certain, certain sets of problems because it's all good to say that I'm going to, you know, get the induced proximity induced superconductivity or magnetism. But in real world, what happens is you're building such a device. There is a gate electrode somewhere and you have a substrate and you have one topological insert and you have something else on top and you usually have a cap. Uh, Somewhere at the boundary, you will have dangling bonds. You will have migration of atoms. You will have surface reconstruction. You will have spin orbit interaction that actually you used to make the topological insulator that is different at different sides of the interface. So in some sense, this was all swept under the carpet for a long time and everybody said, we know there is a helical order in these topological states. And the motivation for what we did was, well, topology, the only thing topology says is, that there is an interface state. It doesn't tell me what quantum numbers for that state are, and these probably depend on details. And that's what we need to do. So uh, this gives the general background for what we're trying to do. And I'll give a few examples of what we've done. We looked at actually the spin structure of the interface states as opposed to surface states and topological insulators. We a little bit looked at proximity induced superconductivity, but we also asked for uh, about topological phase transitions and alloys and uh, investigated the magnetic proximity effect. And so all of it, if I'm uh, high-minded, I'm going to give this quote that between between the idea and the reality falls the shadow, which goes back to T.S. Eliot. And in fact, the first uh, option for my uh, talk was, uh, for the title of my talk, was not alluding to the movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, was actually alluding to this quote, saying that uh, we kind of shadows are important. But then I realized that there is a, a current um, TV show called What We Do in the Shadows, which is about vampires in modern day. And so obviously with receding hair, uh, with hairline and glasses, this is me and uh, all my collaborators can decide who they are. 
but essentially it's the work that is done to ensure that we can actually make something out of topological insulators. So here is the uh, typical example of a topological insulator. It is uh, bismuth selenide and there's a whole family of those things. Uh, so the way we work, we create first a, an effective model. And in this case, the effective model is by observing that, for example, so these, uh, this is the uh, basic unit cell. It's called so-called, well, not the unit cell, but uh, um, sort of, uh, it's a unit cell, it's not a primitive cell. Uh, it's all quintuple layer. So these are bismuths. There are two layers of them. There are three layers of selenium. And if I form the symmetric combinations of bismuth PZ orbitals and anti-symmetric combinations of selenium PZ orbitals, these are the states that contribute the most uh, towards uh, the states near the chemical potential. Because of this, the basis in which I work is the, obviously the spin as well as parity, because these have symmetric and anti-symmetric have different parity. And so the churn number actually appears because of the inversion of parity between the valence and conduction band. So how do I actually think about it? I can write the Hamiltonian. I need to ensure that this parameter M is greater than zero. But the point is that in terms of parity, I can associate the, uh, each state at a, given, uh, at a given crystal momentum, which is kind of implied coordinate in the plane, with a spinner in the parity space. And spinner means that I'm going to put where it, the arrow points. And so, for example, in this example, in the middle, of the brilliant zone, it points down, which means it's, let's say, negative parity. And here, it sort of points almost up at the edges. It's almost the positive parity. Uh, and so somewhere there, there has to be inversion. Now, to show the topological nature of this, you project it onto a plane and realize that this looks like a skirmion. This thing is pointing up in the middle and down everywhere along the edges. And that's a topological phase winding that you cannot unwind without doing something drastic to the system. So this is the sense in which the, in which the system is topological. Now, the, you can, of course, now you have a Hamiltonian, you can easily solve the surface problem. You just say, I have a Hamiltonian, I put the wave function to zero at the edge. And then you can ask, are surfaces the same as interfaces? Because the interface is something different. You have this material, you have the other material, and you have something at the interface. But the wave function in general is allowed to penetrate on the other side. So you can do this. You can, and we did kind of the first calculation was the simplest calculation where I took, we, we just changed the sign of this parameter that makes it into trivial semiconductor on the other side. We classified all the, um, all the possible interface potentials that preserve time reversal invariance so that they don't mix this uh, spins uh, along the interface. And we asked what happened. And because I lost a couple of minutes, I'm not going to tell you that we actually know what symmetry breaking corresponds to each of those terms. But I can tell you the result that if I, um, if I look at the surface states by setting these potentials to infinity, when the, when the wave function cannot penetrate to the other side, I regain what everybody else has, uh, which is the helical Dirac cone of surface states. And since Ravi asked this question, I actually put here uh, during the break the angular result photo emission results. This is the dispersion of the state. It shows the Dirac dispersion. And this is actually shows the spin projection along the particular direction on the right and on the left. This goes from plus essentially one to minus one, which supports the idea that this thing is winding. And because this is an experiment, it's good that our model reproduces that because otherwise we'd be in trouble. However, for general interface states, we have a non-helical and anisotropic Dirac cone. And therefore, what are the consequences of that? Well, for example, there are relatively severe consequences for the proximity induced superconductivity that in some cases you would get, even though your parent superconductor is a posit, has full gap, so the electrons are gapped everywhere, the induced superconductivity in your topological surface layer will have nodes, which means it will have quasi-particles that are not gapped, which means it will have dissipation, which is the first thing you wanted to avoid. 
it also, for example, it has consequences for the uh, magnetical induced uh, magnetic proximity effect because you want to apply the field, you want the gap to open in the spectrum, but the gap might be actually very small depending on, um, on what the details of the surface are. It uh, has positive consequences such as, for example, the transport current induces out-of-plane polarization, which you probably can use in some spintronic devices. But it also depends how much it is. It does depend on how you prepare an interface. Um, again, I will probably skip this, but we have, we proposed an experiment, which is a simple transport experiment for how to measure this. Uh, but because we are doing this, we uh, kind of, it's, imperative for us to try to understand what happens in a given material for a given interface. And because of that, we tried to uh, start uh, sort of ab initio studies of topological insulators, uh, which are based on density functional theory methods. So this means that electron density is fed into some idea of what the interaction between electrons should look like, and then you can calculate the properties of the material from the first principles. The important part that we sort of uh, contributed is understanding that there, is, because this quintuple layers, if you look at the electron count, they almost act as closed shells. So the van der Waals interaction between them is very important. Now there are different implementations of van der Waals interactions uh, in the density functional theory. And in our experience, some of them work and some of them fail and some of them fail spectacularly. Some of them, for example, predict that this will be a metal. Uh, so you have some, you need to choose wisely what you do, but when you do this, you actually get a very nice result that here are the bulk bands and here is your surface state, what happened. It looks like a Dirac cone. And moreover, when you look at it, it actually, this is a topological surface state. And if you look closely, you can actually, and I think this is where we have some of the best data available. You can actually show that it has a very close to helical uh, structure, spin structure here. And that becomes worse and worse as, as you move away from this uh, Dirac point. Now we can use it to try the interfaces and this work is still in progress. But we, what we also did is we tried to explore a different direction, which is to say, look, I mean, the reason we have all this problem at interfaces is because we have vastly different materials. What we can do is we can try to use very similar materials, tuning them so that one is topological, one is non-topological. And for example, the early ideas were that this would selenide is topological, but antimony selenide is non-topological. So you're actually going to alloy one with the other and tune it to topological transition. And so your interface can be tuned to exactly that point. Well, it turns out not to be quite true. If you actually do a more careful analysis, they all become topological, but you can still tune them by applying pressure. Now, the problem is, of course, is that, uh, so you apply pressure, what is shown here is the ground state energy versus the ratio of the uh, two, uh, two primary lattice constants, which is varied by pressure. And so, uh, th oh, sorry, this is the gap. This is not, I'll show you the ground state energy in the next slide, uh, in the next plot, this is, this is the gap. And the gap goes from positive to negative, but that's simply the statement that uh, topological transition is a subtle one. There is no real order parameter associated with it, uh, but you need to look for gap closing. So we follow where the gap closes in this system. And we're uh, finding that for two materials, it closes very close to each other. And in fact, the point where it closes is not that far. So this is the ground state energy where at least one version of the alloy has the energy minimum. So the stable configuration is somewhere there. And so the hope is that by moderate strain, you can actually tune this thing to a topological transition. And um, I am out of time and therefore I'm going to stop here to take questions, but we also investigated the magnetic proximity effect. The essential part of it was that for the main candidate where the, um, which is europium sulfide, where the results were somewhat controversial from experiment, we showed that because of the mismatch in basically work functions and the charge transfer, there will be no 
magnetic proximity effect. And so we have some other ideas for uh, which materials to use or how to use thin film geometries to circumvent that, but that is work in progress. And so my conclusions are essentially that uh, details matter, that all the applications of topological materials rely on interfaces, and interfaces are very different from surfaces. You in principle have more control, but you have a lot more prog problems. Uh, and so you need to develop both understanding and control of many tuning parameters. Hey, Elliot, I think it stopped again. Oh, it froze again. <laughs> Did it freeze for other people? Yes. Yeah. OK. Yep. Um, let me. Yeah, yeah. Since I again got cut off, I moved to my um, to my iPad where I can answer okay. questions. Yeah. So you, you were. I think you had like two more concluding thoughts. So if, if you uh, did I have a con I, I, my concluding thoughts are not particularly important, but let me yeah. <laughs> uh, but let me get the concluding thoughts and see whether they make any sense. So let me just see if I can get the concluding thoughts here. Uh, oh, wait, where are we? I had this. OK. Let's uh, let yeah, me I just say. Can, I think you could look at your other computer. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. Instead off. of sharing. Yeah, exactly. This is not too much trouble. Uh, so my concluding thoughts were that for interfaces, which are very different from the surfaces, we have more control, but many more problems. And so the question is how to uh, employ those tuning parameters uh, to our advantage. And this is basically what we're trying to do. OK, uh, thanks for your talk. That was very nice. Um, are there questions for Ilya? So I'll ask a question. Um, there was a part where you were talking about Majorana particles and uh, the connection to quantum computing. You said we know a lot more about measuring them than creating them. And as kind of an outsider, that's a little counterintuitive. Like. Um, <laughs> If you don't know how to create them, how do you know how to measure? Well, it, it, it's just a, uh, it was a glib statement. But the point is that, uh, in principle, any electron I can write as a, com as a combination of two Majoranas, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in principle, to measure Majoranas, I need to destroy them. But that involves measuring an electron. And mm -hmm. we are very good at measuring electrons. Yeah. So at the end of the day, uh, measuring, my anticipation that measuring will be much less of a problem than creating them. Because basically, you can write formally electron as two Majoranas, but they always will be close to each other. And any interaction, any basically defect or anything will couple them back into the electron. So most of the applications rely on the fact that you have some large object and you get two Majorana modes that are now at the opposite ends. Mm -hmm. And that's what prevents them from hybridizing. And in fact, there are mm -hmm. studies of how well their wave functions overlap at different ends, because you want to prevent that happening. If you don't need to prevent it, they'll go back into electron very quickly. And we have many ways of doing it, many ways of seeing this once they are created. So it's not that people have seen it, but yeah. I don't think that will be a problem. And the same is we know how to move vortices around generally. So if I do have a Majorana mode in the vortex, one can come up with ideas of how to move the vortex, mm -hmm. how to make sure that Majorana is in the vortex. That's an issue. Okay. And so the you know the recently the where there was this um, kind of the implementation of a long semiconductor nanowire wrapped in both uh, wrapped in the superconductor, which was supposed to manifest Majorana uh, modes, and this was a Nature paper in 2018, and it was retracted about two months ago. Right. right. Uh, 
and that was kind of a big deal because that was that was considered one of the strongest evidence that people have found it. Yeah. All right. Any other quick questions for Ilya? We're starting to run into the lunch time. Yeah, I, I have one. Uh, in terms of this, uh, something called the scalability. Is there some perspective on that? Um, I. I'm not qualified to answer that question. I think that's uh, okay. yeah. so. There are people who worry about this, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know what the current status is. Mm. So, in principle, you know, in solid state, we do right. have right. experience with scalability, but uh, but what exactly it means in the context of proposed architectures, mm. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so um, thanks again, Ilya, for the talk. Thanks to all the speakers this morning. Uh, it's been an interesting day. So 